some of you know me, some of you don't, so I'll go through the standard intros. Uh, Sean Wargo, a principal engineer with Cisco Swisham. Um, I've been with Cisco s all, coming up on 20 years, 1999. Um, I haven't quite hit there, but almost 20 years. Uh, spent the majority of that with uh, the venerable Catalyst 6000 series. So if you have seen me around, you've probably seen me writing videos on Cat 6K and uh, these types of things. So, and, and these days I work on all next generation products. Uh, so you probably most recently see me from Software Defined Access um, in some vein along that. Um, but quietly behind the scenes, uh, I've also been helping build the Catalyst 9000 series. So if you have any questions on uh, what we're doing with the Cat 9K and switching and so forth, uh, the more interesting one that we're releasing just now that we really wanted to show off to you guys was the uh, new modular Catalyst 9600 series. Now, unfortunately, I don't have this to throw around like Fred did. Uh, I don't think that'd be a very good idea anyway. Uh, but we will have um, some units around that you guys can see. And obviously, I've got some, some pretty pictures and stuff like that. So the first part, uh, and, and I always like to spend time talking about the agenda. It just kind of sets people for what, what they're going to see. Uh, the first part is really a recap. Uh, you know, this has all been about Wi-Fi 6, it's been about, you know, partner ecosystems. Of course, we've been talking about DNA Center and, and uh, those types of things. So it's really just recapping like, okay, fine, but how does 9600 fit into all that stuff, right? Um, then get into the cool stuff, the, the parts that I know you really want to hear. The, the first part, standard intro, like, what are the big pieces? Why do I care? Um, but then really drill into the, the hardware elements themselves. And then even then, it's like, okay, it's another box. It's not like Cisco hasn't made some boxes before, seen all that stuff, uh, but tell me how I can actually use it, right? So kind of wrap it all up together. So the first part, like I said, uh, you've probably seen this slide. This, in fact, is not even my slide, uh, but it's part of the, the messaging that we're coming out right now, and it's really uh, wired for wireless, right? And what do they mean by that? Well, it's, you know, as Wi-Fi 6 gets bigger, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of multi-gigabit Ethernet. So the speeds of the access layer are getting more and more. So how is the core adjusting to accommodate that, right? So, and then like I said, ecosystems. So this is all programmability. You know, what are you doing to uh, g give me greater and greater access and analytics out of the box and those kind of things. So I'm not covering those things, uh, but I just wanted to put it in context that, that that's why 9600 is part of that, that bigger message. Now, they really center it on these uh, three basic pillars. I'll revisit them as it goes. But, you know, the, the part I really love about this particular one is this purpose built, because it really is one of those things that we built from the ground up. Uh, you know, if, um, some of the other sessions, they talked about uh, Pinaferino. Um, so all of the Catalyst 9000 have been built uh, with the same design standards from Pinaferino. Um, and in particular, you know, how are we building the modules? How are we building the ASICs? What is it that it actually, uh, you know, for this next generation of architecture. Um, I, wanna, I don't like reading off little tiny bullet points in any way I have slides on all that stuff. So again, uh, a slide you may have already seen. Um, I picked this one simply because it talks about the entire Catalyst family and it's the one that really drives home that, uh, you know, uh, like they were talking about the access points or now the Catalyst 9100s, got a new wireless LAN controller, Catalyst 9800. But really the network itself is what connects all these things together. Uh, so in particular, um, and again, the speeds, you know, having multi-gigabit Ethernet, which means greater than one gig, so getting 2.5, 5 gig, well, shoot, that means now I'm going to drive my access layer even higher. So now you'll start seeing things like 25 gig, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about. And then how do I really bundle all that new 25 gig, so getting into 40 gigabit and 100 gigabit Ethernet? Uh, so that's where the, the 9500 and 9600 come in, okay? Now, you know, for a while, we'd come out with 9300, we came out with 9400, uh, then we came out with some of the first gen 9500. You know, and that's, that's fine. Uh, if, the, if the numbering you've never seen, uh, it actually shouldn't be a surprise. We intentionally numbered them to correspond with the predecessor, right? So 9300, for example, is meant to target the, the Catalyst 3000, 94 for 4500. Uh, we've had some fixed uh, gigabit Ethernet switches, uh, so that's where 9500 went. Uh, and then very recently, we introduced the 9200, which is really the low-end uh, fixed access switching. But the thing that's been missing, and what I think is the most interesting for us to talk about, is 
the modular core. And particularly, you know, we've been holding on to Catalyst 6000 for decades now. Um, so this is the one thing that finally completes the entire architecture. So now I have an entire access to core switching architecture. And the next thing I wanted to spend on, it's a little trip down memory lane. You might have seen this, but I think this is crucial to really stitch everything together. One of the more important things we've done is use the common set of ASICs across all the different switches. So before, you know, I would build the CAT3K and it had CAT3K ASICs and it ran a CAT3K software. Then I built the 4K, then I built the 6K. And that translated into, you know, different operating system, different commands, and just tons and tons of complexity for the customer to deal with, right? Plus different software versions, I'd have to certify these all differently. Uh, so by taking this approach, no matter which one of the Cat9Ks you have, go back one slide, uh, they're all one single binary. Literally, there's just one Cat9K universal image, and it doesn't matter which one of these platforms I'm using. Um, and then, you know, the other little bit that's in here, talk about purpose built, right? So as we move into a developer oriented, distributed type of uh, architecture, uh, being able to spin up my own little tiny applications on the switch itself, right? So it's, that in itself is not necessarily new, but it's new to the switching line. So you might've seen it in like the router environments with the UCSE samples like that. But imagine putting like a firewall or something like that uh, that's local to the switch itself. And there's a whole bunch of uh, interesting discussions on that one. So that's what I mean when I say, you know, purpose built, common building blocks and those things. Question. Application hosting, how different is that than what we have today on like the IE switches where we can do application hosting? So in principle, it's the same sort of thing. Um, really, it's about horsepower. This is a, um, the current generation is a four core. Um, it's an x86, it's a Broadwell, if you're interested. Um, and you can get uh, up to 16 gig of memory. So at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're, you're carving off some of the CPU cores and some of the memory. Um, what's interesting here is having a data channel directly to the front panel ports on the switch. So I get a, a you know, 10 gig connection to this virtual machine, and then it's just housed locally on the switch. It's a lot of, it's a, it's a whole world all by itself, really. Um, so picking up on, on the UADP, um, and that's the, the single ASIC that's true for, for all the different switches. Um, and we introduced this first on the 9500, 9500H, um, but it's come again on the 9600. So really, it's really just like 2.0 and 3.0. That's all you have to remember. Um, and I'm not gonna call out every single thing in here. There's a lot of really interesting things that happen here. This is like the first one that went to 16 nanometers. So you say, how do you even achieve things like uh, 20 billion transistors? What's more important for you guys is things like um, being able to change the uh, types of encapsulation that, su that we support. So having, you know, bringing in VXLAN, bringing in MPLS and all the different things that we've got going uh, and not have to re-spin the ASIC to do those kind of things. Um, and then in particular, um, on the scale side, uh, one of the things that I want to talk about um, is this adaptable tables. So what we do is it's, it's big chunks of memory, right? And what I can do is I can recarve those pieces of memory. So let's say I want more MAC addresses. I can make a bigger chunk for MAC addresses, or I want more routes. I can char carve it for routes and NetFlow, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's, the key message here is really that, again, purpose-built, flexible type of architecture. Does, does that happen automatically, the repurposing of, of the resources? So it does not happen automatically. Um, and, it, and if you think about it, it doesn't happen a lot. So, so interestingly, the buffers are shared between the, uh, the ASIC cores, and I can dynamically reshare the buffers uh, to deal with packet bursts and things like this. But as far as memory tables, uh, it's, it's built with templates. So you'd specify, for example, that, you know, hey, like I said, I want more MAC addresses, right? So you'd specify how much of the MAC addresses you want, uh, and then it's a reboot for that. Similar to the SDM preferred. It is, it is in fact, an SDM template, if you're okay. familiar with it. Yeah, that's right. Exactly right. Okay. So let's dig a little bit deeper into it. Um, it's another one of those slides that there's lots of fancy things going on, but I wanted to show it all in one picture. Uh, and I have slides for each one of them. Don't worry about that. Um, key points, it's a six slot, eight rack unit chassis, okay? Um, if you're familiar with that, and, and this is where I don't have uh, Fred's thing to throw it, but it, it's a, a cube, it's about yay high, right? It's actually smaller than the 6807. So it's really, again, purpose-built for campus wiring closets, MDFs, IDFs, 
Uh, some of the customers actually literally shove them into a closet that you know is just a little broom closet with some cables coming in. Uh, so those kind of things really matter. Um, two supervisor slots, four uh, module slots. Um, it calls out differences between capacity and bandwidth, and I, and I wanted to make a point about this. So we already know what's coming in the future. So one of the things about a modular chassis, this is kind of philosophy, like fixed chassis versus modular chassis. I'm buying modular because I want flexibility and investment, right? I want to be able to stick a box in there and then change out cards on and on into the future, right? And just leave that box in there. So having uh, the backplane traces, in other words, wires coming off of the soup, for a total capacity up to uh, 25 terabits in the future. Uh, with the first supervisor you get, it's actually going to have uh, three UADP ASICs on it, uh, and that'll give you 9.6 terabits uh, with just that one supervisor. Now, if you do the math, that is uh, 1.2 terabits per slot, 2.4 terabits full duplex. Always emphasize that it's full duplex, right? Because I can simultaneously transmit and receive. Um, it is a core switch, so the, predominantly we're focusing on fiber, and it'll come with uh, QSFP-based and SFP-based, and I'll talk about each one of these. Uh, another interesting point, because people have been asking, uh, we will be having a, a line rate 48-port multi-gig copper card. Um, it'll be non-POE, because it's a core switch, right? We have, we have regular M-gig on the other switches. Um, and then the various elements over here, uh, we've done a bunch of math to uh, I don't have time to show all you guys, but you know, do comparisons against Catalyst 6000, what's gonna be the impact to the customer, what are they looking for, those kind of things. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Now, one of the things to emphasize here, uh, it's all really in the subtitle, uh, this is a centralized architecture. Okay, so if you've dealt with things like the Catalyst 6000, Nexus 7K, and, and some of the other platforms, uh, what they try to do is uh, distributed, as in I put the performance onto the individual line card, I have to have intelligence on the line card to support that. So you actually gain the benefit of higher capacity, but I bring in a lot of complexity because you know, not only do I have to do the software on the soup, but now I have software running on each of the line cards. You say, well, what happens when I get a switch over or I have to do a software upgrade, and those kind of things, right? So, so one of the key bullets here is it's really the supervisor and everything else is wires. When we say phi, we literally just mean the conversion of the electrical signal, right? Uh, and there's no other components on the line card, okay? There's a small FPGA that keeps track of uh, which supervisor is active, which one's not, but all the magic happens on the supervisor. So what it really boils down to, why do we even care? Uh, we're talking like five microseconds of switch over time, uh, which, you know, you won't even see the packet be lost, right? Um, it also means things like you know, hey, we are going to have supervisors. I talk about that investment into the future thing, right? So just by slapping a new supervisor in there, I immediately gain all the benefits of that new supervisor. More bandwidth, new features, everything, okay? Uh, we already talked briefly about the um, app hosting. Um, the other thing that, that subtle, but I think is important to talk to customers about is uh, mean time between failure, right? And that really just boils down to how many components can fail, right? Uh, because this actually has fewer components, it has a much, much higher, they've already measured all of this. We have a, a huge um, electrical design and verification testing lab. Uh, it more than doubles the, the current MTBF of most of the chassis, right? Any questions? Okay, all right. So looking at this, uh, this is where the, the Pinafarina design stuff comes in. Uh, you'll see that same common kind of design look and feel across all the Catalyst 9000 series. Um, an interesting one is the dual service fan tray. Um, this is also present on the 9400, but like it sounds, it means I can take it from the front or I can completely flip it around and have it from the back, right? Who cares, right? If you think about it, normally people run their cables across it like this. So a lot of people from serviceability have had trouble pulling out that fan because the cables are in the way, right? Little things like that, right? And then again, like sometimes they shove these into closets, literal closets, and like, how is that closet set up? How do I actually get back and, and manipulate those kind of things? Uh, a lot of these are, are true, again, on all the 9Ks, um, but having a uh, built-in RFID so I can actually do an inventory, you can just go with the wand and you can scan all of your equipment and it'll read out for you. You don't actually have to, to log all that stuff. Uh, blue beacons, lots of pretty, 
little blue lights that blink. You can, the administrator can set that and say, you know, I've got racks and racks of switches. You can just turn on, you know, switch number 10 on module one and it'll sit there and blink and then the guy can go down and say, oh, go to that, that blinky blue light. So it's, it's simple, but it's like really improves their, uh, their you know, management. Um, we talked about, you know, the four line cards, the two supervisors, uh, and then again, the um, eight rack units. I think those are like key highlights for this guy. The magic, again, is in the soup. That's the part to really focus on and what's most interesting about it. Uh, I mentioned that it is uh, three UADP ASICs laid together. Uh, and I know you guys are, are a technical crowd, so I have some block diagrams. You know, we'll get past the, uh, the highlights. Um, you know, you were asking about the application hosting, and I mentioned the, the cores. Uh, it also has built-in uh, storage. So this is another interesting side. Uh, if I actually am running a, a virtual machine on the system, then I need disk storage somewhere. So it actually has a, comes with a built-in uh, M2 SATA drive, and you can add uh, USB 3 drives to it as well. Um, already talked about the other pieces. So like I said, uh, block diagram. Now, if anything, what I'll draw attention to is, is it's actually a very simple layout, right? Um, so you've got the three different ASICs, uh, and they each provide a series that's network interfaces, if you're familiar with that one. Uh, so these are just literally the wires on the backplane, okay? Uh, each one providing 1 1.6 terabits itself, and then you see there's interconnects, and if you're familiar with um, how stacks work, this is basically like a stack internal. So if one ASIC needs to talk to another, it just sends it across and goes out the other side, that kind of thing. Um, and it's really two different blocks. One's the forwarding block, and then the other is like the management block with your CPU, memory, USB, and so forth. Now, starting with the line cards, another interesting thing, we, you know, we tried to simplify some of the language. Yeah, question. On the last slide, it showed 64 uh, interfaces per ASIC. Is that a hard limit, or is that just the way it's done today? So that's the number of individual traces that this ASIC supports. Um, and you know what we're when I get to the line card, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, each one of the phi's supports a hundred gig, so it's really just math, right? We're doing one point six terabits divided by sixty four to get to four of twenty five. Um, but as far as the number of traces, so back to like um, you know the total capacity of the system, it can actually go much much higher than that. That's just how this particular ASIC set up. No, yep. good question. Okay. Um, I keep driving home like flexibility, flexibility, right? That's one of the key messages. Um, so everybody's standardizing on either QSFP or SFP, right? So you won't get these weird like CPAC and, and all these other types of things. So these are in fact QSFP 28 interfaces, uh, which is the standard 400 gigabit ethernet, okay? Uh, but these can operate in either uh, 40 gig or 100 gig, okay? Um, we do support this QSA, which is QSFP to SFP adapter. It's not even very imaginative. Uh, but that's what QSA means. So I can literally stick in uh, a 10 gig SFP uh, and reuse that 40 gig port, right? Um, now with the SUP1 itself, uh, because if you do the math, right, that's 1.2 terabits per slot. So I would need, uh, I, I can get 12 total ports. I would need 240 or 2.4 tera to get all um, 24 ports at 100 gig. So um, the example I gave of like, I can actually just take out the soup and it'll immediately become a full line rate 100 gig line card, but I can do uh, all 24 at 40 gig, or I can do 12 ports at 100 gig and I can mix and match, okay? And it's really just set up, this is like the fast version. I have much deep, more detailed slides, uh, but basically these two ports are a port group. Right, so I can operate one as a hundred gig, right, and then this other one gets disabled, and then I can have different sets of uh, forty. And I can mix and match. There's no limit on that. Okay. So, this is what I was just describing. So when I when I take it out of the box, it defaults to forty gig mode, right? But if I want, hey, you know, a couple of these ports, maybe they're uplinks, right? This is quite standard connecting to the data center, connect to the service provider. I want those to be 100 gig. And then with just one single command, we'll turn off its uh, neighbor port. But then I can have mixes of 40 gig and 100 gig like that. So this is what I was just referring to from the network interfaces. So it doesn't say it on the slide, but this is a, a 25 gig channel, right? So in other words, like I said, it's a, it's a port block, a pair of ports. So this one QSFP 28 port, ports one and two, 
right? Gets a total of 100 gig to it. So I've got four times 25 gig out of there. And if you do the math, that's uh, uh, the 1.6 tera. Now, the other interesting thing that's here, uh, again, I have this in my deeper slides, but I talked about that, um, you know, having a direct connection to the standby supervisor and five uh, microseconds of uh, switchover. The reason for that is, is the standby supervisor's traces are already online, and even better, he's already forwarding data. So, like I said, it's, it's super simple passive, and the only thing that's interesting here is it's FPGA, and it's only job is to receive data from both supervisors and decide uh, who's active and who's standby. So in other words, the standby is actually sending data, and the moment the active dies, he just begins receiving data from the standby. So that's how you achieve that uh, super high switchover. But otherwise, like I said, it's as simple as it can be, right? And that's actually a good thing in this case. Uh, so building out from there, uh, the 48 port SFP, so we got QSFP line card, SFP line card, now the YL, uh, what, this is what I really wanted to start talking to you guys about, 25 gig ethernet. So 25 gig ethernet is like, from the, the core switching perspective, the new evolving technology that everybody's paying attention to. Uh, the reason why is just like multi gigabit ethernet, right? I can reuse the same cable, right? Everybody's heard the multi gig story, right? I, I can get more bandwidth out of the same cable. So this is the same logic, I can keep using the same old multi-mode fiber they put in their building like 10 years ago, and now I can give them 25 gig ethernet, okay? Um, and then the flexibility bit, right? These are all just SFP form factors, so it doesn't matter if I stick in 25s, 10s, 1s, and so on. Uh, I even have some military customers, believe it or not, that are still on 100 meg fiber. Um, but, you know, if you, again, you do the math, I'm getting uh, enough bandwidth that I can do all line rate on all these different ports, okay? Same basic LAN card layout, in fact, makes it all super easy, right? Um, the only thing that's different in this case is the literal phi. So I'm taking that, that uh, cage and the electrical signaling uh, to the SFP ports now instead of uh, the QSFP ports, okay? So can I run all, 20, all 48 ports 25 gig or does it shut off ports like the other LAN card? Good question, no, you can run all line rate 25 gig. Any sport, any port, any speed, line rate for 25 gig. Absolutely. Very good question. Yeah, I mean, it's a core box. It's got to run at these kind of rates. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, like I said, uh, this is still coming. I thought it was interesting to show. It's, it's committed roadmap. This is not like a wish list. Um, but uh, particularly, there are customers asking us for that. And, and the interesting thing why I wanted to talk about it was uh, some people actually have copper for their access layer to their core not just uh, down to their devices. So if I have a copper infrastructure, then I need a core box that can do uh, downlinks at copper, right? And again, it's, to him, it's 10 gigs, so I can do all 48 ports at line rate. Okay, looking at some of the um, use cases, and it's pretty simple, right? Pretty easy stuff. Um, SD Access has been our big uh, seller of late, and you say, okay, well, how does it actually, add? and I have some slides to correspond, this is the, uh, the intro. Um, talked about app hosting, uh, obviously things like uh, high availability are gonna be top, uh, top of mind for anything in the core. Uh, so things like ISSU, uh, Stackwise Virtual, whenever you see a marketing slide, look for the asterisks. Uh, so we support Stackwise Virtual today on the uh, 9500s and 9400s. So this is just a software thing. Okay, um, so it actually is running right this moment. They just have to finish the certification. Um, from the programmability perspective, again, DevNet, ecosystem, uh, all of the Cat9Ks support uh, NetConf and Yang. Um, there's a Crimson DB, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, a system database uh, that keeps track of the network state and all of this can be streamed off uh, via telemetry. So of course, this is also supported on uh, 9600. Um, Interesting things like 256-bit uh, MACSEC at line rate on all the ports. Um, the other things we just talked about were things like the 25-gig uh, uh, interfaces. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is a dual rate. So this is really actually closer to multi-gig, uh, where it can operate at 10-gig, depending on which transceivers are plugged into the remote side. Um, that's one of its key flexible questions. Is the embedded, embedded controller basically like the 9800? Right now. So from a scale perspective, uh, and this is, this is again common to the Cat9K family, uh, but it is a iOS-based wireless LAN controller, 
uh, and it operates. So, so in that sense, it is just like the 9800. Uh, now, the 9800 obviously is going to be bigger, and it's dedicated for that purpose. Uh, but if you need, for example, let's say I have a, a branch office, and I just want to stick one of these in there. Uh, it can be your SD access border and control plane. It can simultaneously be the wireless LAN controller. It can be an edge node, uh, all these things. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a question related to that. So you, you talked about the internal storage uh, for the wireless controller. Would you use that internal storage to to have the, you know, like a, a VM of the 9800 on it? Or is it So separate? that's actually a separate option. Excellent okay. question all by itself. You actually can run uh, a, a VM version of the wireless line controller, but that would be a VM as a wireless line controller. That's just, the interesting thing about the embedded wireless is it's part of the iOS XE operating system. Uh, that's how the two are different. Yeah. Okay. So picking up on SD access, because it is um, the thing we talk about a lot, um, now, there's a lot of reasons. One, one of the things I struggled with was how do I boil this down to like the interesting things? Uh, you guys can read slides and data sheets all day long, so I'm just going to call out the interesting things. Um, obviously, when you're talking about SD access, you're talking about uh, the border, the control plane. Uh, he's the guy at the top of the network, the, the traditional core switch that's going to connect to all the other areas, right? So this is a critical you know, what types of uh, encapsulations does he support? What kind of protocols does he support? Uh, I have a slide on that in just a moment. Um, and the thing we just talked about, I, I can also run this as an edge, as in I can plug in clients directly. So being a lot of people have like server farms that are at their core, a local shared services, maybe that's where I put my wireless LAN controller. Um, that also adds things like fabric in a box. The thing I mentioned, I could actually just drop this in and it can be all of those things at the same time. Um, other little things that are cooked in there, um, whenever we do the uh, multi-domain, multi-site, connecting multiple sites together, <coughs> excuse me, you got to be able to support uh, this SD access transit. Um, another interesting one we're looking at is the uh, VIPTEL integration actually as a hosted application, similar to what you were describing. Um, if you're looking at things like uh, layer two and layer two flooding, uh, native multicast, these are all unique to Cat9K features. So having a 9600 as your SD access border is what gives you these extra features. If I were to do that on a CAT 6K, I wouldn't have those features available to me. Okay. Um, and then all of the you know, expected things about just, you know, like I talked about ISSU and, and uh, greater bandwidth, those kind of things, all those will naturally benefit uh, being a border. Uh, HA, all the things you'd expect, um, redundant power supplies, we can do AC and DC. They can actually be mixed if they're at 220 volt. Um, there is only a single fan tray, but there are multiple fans in there, and so you can actually support multiple fan failures in that single fan tray. Uh, obviously, you guys get the supervisor, and we talked a little bit about that, that uh, five uh, microsecond switchover. Um, and with that comes all the software to do SSO and SF. These are all expected things. Um, the other part we just talked about was the uh, Stackwise Virtual, so now having that across two chassis, and that's the equivalent of a VSS in, in a Catalyst 6000, Catalyst 4000 world. Um, now, other things we haven't really talked about are this like software maintenance unit. And if, you, if you're familiar with this, the, the lower end switches, you've probably heard SMU, uh, but it's patching. Um, particularly, we just released hot patching. Um, so an ISSU means, look, I'm gonna take version one, which was my old version, and completely upgrade to version two, right? But a lot of times it's just some bug, not that Cisco has bugs, nobody has bugs. Uh, but you know, these things happen, right? Or maybe it's a, a security alert, right? It's not even classified as a bug, but some small thing that I need to change, I've already certified this image, I just wanna change that, that small thing. Um, so we'll support uh, smooths and uh, full ISSU on this chassis, okay? Yeah. So that means, so you're saying hot patching, so that means no hit to the data plane, still passing traffic, not making changes. So there's, changes. there's two variants. Yeah, excellent point. Um, so there's two variants, and it really comes down to what's changing. So if it's like in the microkernel level at the infrastructure, it's going to require a reboot. There's, there's no alternative to that. But if it's a software process level, so let's say OSPF had a bug or something, uh, it's a true hot patch, no hit to the data plane. And that's something that we would know when the release came out, right? And we Correct. would see that in the notes Absolutely. and make a decision on our own part workflow. Exactly right. Yeah. Another question or no? Okay. All right. The other part I talked about is, uh, and it's not all just SD access, right? Um, but the core has to be connected to all the other areas, 
right? So, and, and one of the things about the Cat 6K was its flexibility. It was the proverbial God box. It could go anywhere. Um, now, Cat 9K is still bringing in some of the super fancy service provider features that Cat 6K has. But if you want to talk about, you know, the baseline uh, MPLS, L3 VPN, L2 VPN, UMPLS, uh, VPLS, all these things are already on uh, the 9600. Um, we already talked about SD access. Uh, we do support BGP eVPN. Uh, so if I'm connecting to a data center, perhaps a third party, um, and then all the just the traditional things, V4, V6. One of the things I didn't touch on in the beginning, but I meant to, was uh, UEDP3 was built with a double width table. So one of the interesting things there, uh, why that matters, uh, V4 and V6 at line rate at full scale. Right? So a lot of other platforms, because the, the width of the IPv4 versus the IPv6 uh, address, they only support single width. And to do v6, they have to pass it back through the ASIC again. So this is why you wind up with half the table size and, and half the performance. So UDP3 has this double width table and can do that at full line rate. So that's, I saw v6 there, I'm like, oh yeah, I should say that. Um, and those kind of things. But you guys get the point, right? Lots of different features. These can all run simultaneously. I can have MPLS over here, SD access over there, those kind of things. So I'm looking at the last part, Fabricor. So do it yourself. What does that mean exactly? And like, really, what I'm asking is, I, I can I can use this to configure uh, VXLAN. I don't need to look at other hardware like ASRs. Correct. I can do it right on here. Yeah, and and it's it's really the difference. This is the uh, SE access means it's run by DNA Center. Uh, so BGP VPN itself, in this case, I'd go to the CLI or, or use APIs, but I you know fully support VPN with VXLAN that way. Yep. Okay, almost done. Uh, I, I said I wanted to kind of leave you with this, and I think this is the most interesting discussion to have on this. Um, it's not exactly specific to 9600, but it's what the core switches really need. So 9500, 9600, and even the 94s and 93s, they're, they're uplinks, right? So it's that, that middle layer between the distribution and the core. Um, now, we sort of already talked about it, but, but the piece I really wanted to talk about here was this multi-rate optics. Uh, and what it boils down to, you guys can see the pictures. Uh, there's a variety of them, SR, LR, ER, all the different types of standards. The most interesting one are these CSRs, uh, which gives you much greater distances, right? Uh, and the multi-rate piece. So the, you know, what I want you to take away from this is the picture. Right? It, in the first part, I have a traditional 48 of one gig, okay? And then I would try to do, you know, some 10 gig and then 40 gig, those types of things. Now, if I were trying to use just straight, regular 25 gig optics, I have to change both sides, All right? This is the whole moral of the story, right? And that's fine if I have four or eight core switches, but what about my 20 or 100 or 200 access layer switches, right? Um, so what the dual rate buys you is look, I can change out just one side, say the core side, he's in a 25 gig uh, thing, but he's operating at 10 gig. So he sees that the remote neighbor, the access layer switch, is still at 10 gig, okay? And he'll just operate in 10 gig until the time comes in a regular refresh cycle that I can go out and say, okay, these block of 10 are gonna become 25 gig. And just by changing the optic, that whole uplink becomes 25 gig, right? Um, and then the other piece is what we talked about, cable distances, right? Um, some of the original standards, right, that has to be super awesome fiber, single mode, and as a customer, you know, I just installed all this fiber into my building, it's incredibly expensive to rerun that fiber, right? So this is over standard OM3, OM4, multi-mode fiber, uh, and I can get the same distances that I'm getting out of 10 gig for it. Um, so that, again, it's not exactly 9600, but, but it's a super valuable uh, capability that Cat9K is bringing. So, in summary, um, they talk a lot about, you know, again, uh, future proofing, investment protection. Um, obviously, you guys get what TCO is. Um, but it's talking about, like, the things I said, being able to just swap out the soup and get extra, uh, I get new features out of it, I get extra bandwidth out of it. Um, the bit we just talked about, you know, as the, the access layer speeds, Wi-Fi 6, are, are driving the access layer, I need to upgrade my core. How are you helping me upgrade my core and not spend a, a ton of money? And then, uh, you know, just a three tier versus spline. That's a little dig at some other people, uh, but it's really a, a two tier versus three tier discussion, right? It's actually much more economical. I have all the math if you want it uh, to build out a three tier hierarchy than to try and have a, a two tier 
uh, clause-based architecture in the campus. Very, very expensive from the fiber and the transceivers and those kind of things. Um, so putting all those things together, uh, you know, and again, all the features that you see from the Catalyst 6000 series, uh, now we can finally have one family across our entire, uh, you know, enterprise network campus environment. And that's it. Uh, any questions for me? Just to, <clears throat> just to wrap it up. So in the future, you're expecting customer to, um, you know, keep the chassis and just upgrade the supervisor to get new feature, like let's say t five years down the road or? That's correct. That's okay. correct. Yeah. And, and even the, again, like it's, it's somewhat philosophical, uh, fixed versus modular. Um, because we also have the Catalyst 9500 series, uh, you know, so I could put 9500s in there, but if I change my port speeds, for example, I'd have to pull out that switch and put in another switch. Here, I just take out the module, stick in another module, right? So the box stays in place. For those that might be in a two-tier implementation and they need more slots, is this going to stay at a six slot? So then maybe it would make sense for them to buy two of these chassis? Excellent question. In fact, uh, I was expecting it to happen earlier. Um, so the reason we have lots of slots has more to do with port density, right? In the old days when you only had eight ports on a card or 16 ports on a card, the only way to get more total ports was to get more slots, right? Uh, and, you know, if you do the math, um, the most I can get out of a, a Catalyst 6000 series is a 16 port card, right? So just by supporting 48 ports here and having four of those, I actually end up with almost double the number of ports at a higher speed. Right. Um, but then to your second point, uh, because we've reduced the cost on all this and made it very, very economical, uh, it's actually less expensive to get one gigantic chassis than to have two of them. So um, I don't want to back up several slides. The other thing is the architecture, the view of the network. Um, so traditionally what you would do is you would just have these two gigantic boxes sitting at the core. Right. And that's mo mostly for cost reasons. Uh, but from an architecture perspective, what I would like to do is have a whole bunch of, of smaller, you know, medium-sized boxes, right? So think equal cost multipath, um, you know, port channels, these types of things. So if any, any one of those were to fail, I would have all the remaining ones still in place. Uh, so for those reasons, uh, we've made it the, the six-slot chassis. So I'm thinking, so anyone that's bought, say, 9500 recently for cores, what would you say to them? Is there anything that's really pushing to get to 9600 to do a rip and replace? Well, it's at this the point? flexibility piece that I talked about, um, and and the good news is that they are precisely the same hardware, same ASIC, same software, same everything. So now it's really uh, design philosophy more than anything, right? Um, and the 9500s themselves, a lot of times uh, when you talk about the distribution layer, those really are closets, right? And you can just stick those, you know, or on a shelf somewhere, those kind of things. That's really what the 9500 was was made for. Um, but as I as I aggregate all of those back to some some main hub, uh, that's where you want a core box, a traditional modular type of chassis. So it's really design philosophy is the answer.